curious if you had any, you know, memories of the the studio sessions or if you had any, um, you know, anything special you recollected about Freehand? Well, Freehand was the, the first one uh, that we did after the change of management. And uh, we, we felt a lot more comfortable then. We were getting uh, good reviews and, and great concerts in, in America. And uh, we were moving into bigger and bigger venues. Uh, and even at that time, we were starting to headline smaller, like 5,000 seaters. So there was definitely a taste uh, of success there and um, we, we were really up for it you know really wanted to go for it and what had happened was because of the change of management uh, we had a little bit more time to actually prepare for this album uh, especially rehearsal time uh, it was written pretty quickly as uh, as uh, Kerry and Ray always did but uh, we, we did a bit more in rehearsal this time, so we knew them a bit better. Uh, the other albums I'd been on, it had all been done in a rush, you know, because of the, the, uh, the touring and uh, uh, it was quick, uh, write, record, you know, get the album out and that's it. So we had a lot more time. I actually knew what was coming, which was, uh, which was great. So it it to flow. Was it typical of you to get to the studio and the material is all new, fresh for you to uh, figure out what to do with? No, oh, it's like a, a 50 50 thing. Um, Octopus was certainly like that. That was just, you know, a couple of quick rehearsals in, done. Uh, Power and the Glory, a little less so. But there's, there's still, there was still a lack of rehearsal time. But uh, in fairness, we, we didn't like to rehearse too much, um, you know, to get to know the, the songs too well, because at that time it, it would rob it of a, a bit of um, improvisation. You know, uh, take, you take chances uh, when, you don't, when you don't know it, and sometimes that works out really good. Do you feel, uh, or I guess when you when you were encountering this new music, uh, can you give us some sense of what was running through your head in songs like um, "On Reflection"? <laughs> you know, where it just starts out with this really unique vocal part, and then it turns into this incredibly orchestrated uh, piece of music. You know, what what's going through your mind when you when you first encounter it and you're being asked to perform on it? <laughs> well, uh, Kerry never ceased to amaze me, the stuff he came up with. Uh, but the, the thing was, he was classically trained and what would come out of his head was just out of his world. It, it was, you know, you never knew what was going to happen from one second to the next all these different changes and the, the uh, he'd write it all out of course uh, I don't read music myself uh, so it was a case of learning it off by heart uh, and I used to get little cassette tapes from um, from Kerry in the post and learn them count through them and by the time I got all the counts right in my head I knew the song but the on reflection is just amazing to listen to the first like uh, demo of that, and later on I got to play the, the vibes in it on stage, which was a real treat, you know. And the uh, I was doing a lot more singing at that point with the band, and uh, that was that was interesting as well. It, it was always great working in the studio with the guys because uh, we worked hard. It wasn't party time at all. 
in the studio. We went in, and we worked, and we were very proud if the thing took one take, if you could do it in one take or two takes. Uh, actually, recording the, the the backing tracks, if we didn't get it in three takes, we'd abandon it and come back to it later. So it it was. Um, it was a musical education for me, really, because, uh, uh, you know, Kerry's a genius, There's no two ways about it. Right, right. So when you are, <laughs> when you don't read music and you're being asked to play these complex vibe parts, how are you learning them? Is it by ear or, you know, are, are you good on the vibes, you know, as a just the standalone play it by ear instrument or are you memorizing you know where to hit or what well Kerry showed me what it was and I practiced it until I got it right and it, it's quite a it's it's quite a piece actually but um, I, don't think I, I, I don't think I ever forgot it because you, to, when you learn it you learn it if you read music, you sit down and you read it, and the moment you turn that page, it's gone. But when you learn it, you really learn it. And, well, I've always been able to knock out a tune on anything, really, you know. Just hand me an instrument, and I'll, I'll get some kind of tune out of it. Uh, but I, I love playing the vibes on stage, so that was great. Always a challenge. And what about um, pieces like Talibant, uh, you know, these sort of early music sounding pieces with a lot of the Renaissance uh, type influence? Did you, were you, did you walk into these types of pieces and you just kind of knew what to do or, you know, how did you approach them? Uh, well, as far as Talibant is concerned, I wasn't on that at all. Uh, the story with that is, I didn't play it. I didn't play on it. Um, the story with that was that um, uh, Ray and Kerry had been asked to do the theme music for a, a television series, a new television series of Robin Hood. So what they did was they got together with Ray's Revox and they played it between them on, uh, you know, to, to submit to the TV company. Well, anyway, the whole the whole thing was shelved. So uh, when they brought it into the studio for the freehand album, uh, the demo was so good. Ray said, "Well, actually, what I'd like to do is recreate the demo in the studio, just myself and Kerry, and Kerry played all the percussion." and Ray played all the guitar and other parts. So I wasn't involved. I, I just sat back and enjoyed the, um, the recording process that, that they did. Because don't forget that uh, Kerry's got a degree in percussion. I'm just a drummer, or was just a drummer. He got a I, I think you're underselling yourself a little, I mean, I don't think anyone in this band is just an anything. Everyone played many things. That, and uh, that's what makes the band so unique and interesting and special, I think, that no one is just a you know bassist or drummer or whatever. You, you all contributed special capabilities beyond the instrument. But Kerry, Kerry is a magnificent, magnificent percussionist. I mean, you, you could put a sheet of music in front of him. He could play anything, you know, anything at all. Because, I mean, vibes and marimba and stuff like that is, is percussion. Uh, and he, he just, on one of the later tunes, design, he plays everything. Absolutely everything on it. Because he was the best guy for the job. I mean, Gary Green's a great percussionist. He can he play... Uh, tambourine far far better than I could he used to do all the tambourine parts <laughs> I just sat in the back and laid it <laughs> yeah so I feel 
that's a unique thing about Gentle Giant. Um, there are a lot of a lot of drummers who might have tried doing things, you know, perhaps more artistically or something like that. I I love that what you're doing is supporting the band and you're providing sort of a framework for them to just go. But I'm curious, what was that um, a natural uh, decision for you? Uh, or was it something where you just felt, okay, for this context, this is the most appropriate thing to do? Uh, the latter. Um, I, I came in as a rock drummer. i just come out of um, the Grease Band, which is four to the bar and grabs and stuff like that. Lay into it. So when we started uh, rehearsing, uh, I... When, when I first met the band, they only wanted me to stand in for um, for one tour because Malcolm had broken his uh, shoulder bone and a leg on in a uh, motorcycle accident. Uh, so I went in and we started rehearsing and they were playing, you know, it was all fancy stuff. I was learning three friends and I said, well, hey, hang on a minute. Uh, do you really want me to phrase that bit? What if I just sit on it and you, you put the stuff on top? It's, I think it's going to sound better. And we, we tried it and it really, really worked because that, as you say, the, like the bedrock, I was providing a bedrock. So there was far more space for them to, for them to, uh, for you to listen to what was really going on up there. You know, you didn't have the drums getting in the way because, you know, a lot of busy players, they, they phrase every single thing that, that comes up, everything that's interesting. Or, But I, I don't play that way. So I just laid it down and they, they liked it. They liked it so much they wanted me to stay on. In talking with Gary, he <laughs> he always talked about just where is the one, and sometimes the one was every single beat. <laughs> and I was curious, uh, where where is your head when you're thinking of of playing, let's say just the same or freehand? Some of these songs are very very complex, uh, and in terms of counting, you know, if you're not reading a sheet that's like six five six four, four, you know, like what, what's going through your head? Is it, you just remember the, the composition itself and you just play through what you hear or are you counting, you know, and if so, how are you finding the one? It's, it's a bit of both because I, as I say, when I got a demo, I used to work it up by bars and then listen to the tune on top and use a mix of the two. Uh, like mobile, for instance, is alternating bars of four and five. But it just swings along because I'm following the tune. I'm not going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one. I'm just playing along with the tune and a little flourish on, on the five. Um, so I, I always listen to the listen to the tune, but I knew the sequence of um, uh, the measures, you know, right the right the way through. I I knew what was coming next, certainly with with freehand. Sometimes it caught me out, but uh, most of the time it was it was okay. On his last voyage. It's such an incredibly beautiful, beautiful piece. And then it turns into this sort of blues rock jam. <laughs> you know, just tell me your thoughts on, on that piece and how you approached it as a drummer. When I first heard it, I thought it was, it was Baroque, you know, when I heard the first section. But as we kind of developed it, just speaking that that center section is so slinky and uh when we first did it it was just myself and ray you know with um uh 
Kerry, Kerry and, and Gary just playing um, DI, uh, scratch tracks, we call them. Um, and we just got a feel. My, my Ray is such a wonderful, wonderful bass player. Oh, my goodness. And we got this feel between us in the studio. And I was using dynamics in that slinky bit, starting the the uh, the fill off loud and then ooh, easing it back up to I think I love that slinky section and the guitar solo is oh so wonderful uh, I mean real blues guitar solo in the middle of a, a thing that starts you know baroque with its lovely soft west country voice it's uh, so typically uh, gentle giant you know using all those different modal things you know and changing from one thing to the other and you kind of the slinky section was almost like taking a breath you know just sitting back and and enjoying just go we going in waves like like so and and Oh, Gary playing over the top. Oh, it was lovely. That's uh, my probably my favourite track on the album because it, there's so many different bits and pieces on it. Lovely job. Tell me about Time to Kill. That's a much more straightforward rockin' song. Oh, I, I enjoyed that one. It, there's lots of good bits in that. In fact, there's, there's nothing that I dislike on the, the album at all. I, I think it's so diverse. There's so many different things on it. Because just the same as a straight out rocker. You know, and, and then you get then you get on reflection. How could it possibly be the same band and doing it? You know, but that that's the way the band was, you know, you you had uh, Gary who was the blues player. I'm the kind of a rock drummer. Raymond is bebop jazz and Kerry is classical baroque. So you've got all these different guys all throwing in ideas. So you're bound to come up with something different, aren't you? Absolutely. Did you did you revel in the music when it was being made? Like, you know, it sounds almost like um, you revere it or you're in awe of the, the way it came out. And I think rightly so, because the album is a work of art. Uh, were you feeling that way as you made it or shortly after it was released? Like, wow, this is this is something to be truly proud of. Um, that's, that's strange, because after we recorded an album and put it out, I would never listen to it. I would always hate it. Maybe I'd go back to it six months later. The actual recording itself, because there was always something that I was unhappy with. Always something. But over time, that it would only be so minuscule that nobody ever notices it except you. You know, uh, but it was just, you know, when we finished the album, whoa we were off on tour then promoting it so we started playing just the same and on reflection on stage so and they were always different the stage arrangements were always very very different to the recorded arrangement or the arrangement that was on the record so we treated them both differently always but i was very happy with um, when we did the final mix, which was always always fun because you, you had all the band gathered round the, the desk, and we'd all have little jobs to do. We're just in this, that, and the other. You know, it wasn't automatic then. Uh, you had to t actually turn knobs during the mixing process. You know, mixing from from twenty four down to down to two down to the stereo mix. So it, it was always hard work, you know, and I, I'd be standing on 
the back of the desk and there, there was Ray and uh, the engineer and, and Gary and everybody was involved in the mix. So, so it, I did a lot of hip-hopping too, you know, I used to enjoy that uh, for all the drop-ins and stuff like that. It was, uh, but I, I was very happy with the, with the, um, with the, with the final, with the final uh, mix on the record. I didn't, I didn't think it was anything more special at the time than um, uh, Octopus or, or uh, Power and the Glory. I, it was just the next album. But I didn't realize, I, I didn't realize, actually, when I knew that uh, we were going to do this interview, I listened to the whole album for the first time in years and went, wow, that's quite good. That is really nice. It's that. It is quite good. It's brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you for saying so. I, you know, I, I was only one fifth of the, of the, uh, of the band so for you to say that is very kind but the the real heroes the real heroes are Kerry Minear and Derek Shulman and Raymond Shulman because they come up with the musical ideas I mean we all we all put ideas in at the at the rehearsal stage but they would only be small little things that it was pretty well complete before we took them into uh, Advision so it was just a question of uh, getting it absolutely the best we could at that time. One thing I have always wanted to ask you about is ex is um, experience. That song on In a Glass House. It what what a mind twister, you know. Um, and I've listened to your drum part on that so many times. I'm a, I'm a very intermediate or even beginner drummer myself. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't even know what to do with that song because it sounds uncountable. Uh, that whole da 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 and you're going da 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 Like, how, how were you coming up with parts for these? <laughs> These uh, these insane songs, particularly experience, because that that one is just so out there to me. Oh, was it you? Can it be so shallow where short sighted these years only by To realize the folly of these unnoticed Simplicity uh, If they wanted me to play more they'd say can you play a bit more So I'd play a bit more But I'd start off nice as uh, that, that little shuffle is, you know, I thought, well, just it leaves so much room on top. That's the the whole idea of it, uh, of the way I played it. And your, but the kick drum is sort of, it's almost like it's in a different time signature. <laughs> I I know you're playing with it, but it it seems like the kick and and your and the snare and hat are two different minds and they do come together but i feel like that's what's brilliant about uh that song in particular because even if even carries right and left hand you know like if you look at what each hand is doing and how they're each contributing to this whole i feel like your your drum part is doing the same thing and ray's bass part is is like it's an, from another planet, so it's like these three planets coming together. <laughs> well, it, 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 is, it always was a bit like a jigsaw, you know, a musical jigsaw. Um, 
And that's why I, I just stayed simple and phrased important parts or parts that I thought I thought needed phrasing. Uh, there's no point in, in uh, oh, playing bricks for the sake of it. You you want to play a brick and it, it it's got to mean something. It's got to oh oh that was good or that was you know and taking you on to the next section or um, embellishing uh, a part where the rest of the guys aren't doing a great deal. You know, it, uh, uh, there were some really strange things, you know, uh, as, as far as playing is concerned. I, I, I used to try lots of different things, mind you, not just um, uh, to stay simple right the way through. Uh, in rehearsal, you know, we would all discuss what we were all going to play. So... Uh, I tried to keep it simple and make the bricks really count. Uh, that's, that's what it's all about, as far as I was concerned, anyway. But I, I love the challenge of the stuff because uh, some of it is just right off the wall. You know, The boys in the band, you've tried counting that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you... Um... I know from my own experience, I've written and recorded music where I thought, what, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Did you ever have these sort of moments? Uh, like, what on earth are we trying to accomplish here? <laughs> no, because it was, um, it was such a challenge. Uh, I've always loved a challenge and I've always been in, in bands except for my first couple of bands, which were just, you know, back in the uh, 60s and playing straight out rock and roll. Uh, from the mid 60s, I was playing in bands that were writing their own music, you know, and in getting influenced by the West Coast uh, movement. Uh, and uh, the band called the Eyes of Blue that I was in, uh, we, we did quite a lot of what would now be called early prog. You know, there, there was a classical influence in that. Um, so I always, I always played music that was a bit challenging, except for the Grease Band. And the only thing challenging in the Grease Band was the rest of the band, because they were crazy. <laughs> right off it. Those guys, talk about rock and roll party, and those are the guys who were away with the fairies really 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 mad guys fighting and all smashing up hotel rooms and stuff like that and uh, that was the only challenge with them uh but um the uh, playing drums with them was a challenge at first because because uh, they were so crazy but uh, i i had almost had a breakdown on a european tour and uh I, I was determined to beat it, uh, and I did. And very soon after, um, uh, one of the band got poached by uh, uh, McCartney. Uh, Henry McCulloch got poached, and the band split up. So, so my next band was all back to, back to progressive music. You know, when when I heard what Giant were doing, oh, I would. That was great, great news for me. It was a musical challenge rather than a challenge of, you know, staying out of the way of getting punched by the, uh, by the rest of the band. <laughs> yeah, a slightly different challenge for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. They were crazy mothers, the, the, the Grease Band. Oh, my God. <laughs> Any other uh, freehand anecdotes that come to mind before we wrap up? Well, um, as I said, that uh, playing on reflection live used to be that used to be a challenge because I had to kind of run round, you know, play the vibes, do a bit of singing, uh, play a bit more vibes, and then run back to the kit, stuff like that. And uh, oh, there was there was one. 
was one night in Ebbets Field in uh, uh, oh, was it Denver, where there were microphones all over the place. And as I was running back, I was ducking down and ducking up and ducking down. And a hernia dropped out. Uh, a muscle dropped out of my stomach. Oh, no. As it was, yeah. And I just reacted by pushing it back in. And it was fine. Really was. And now I have a real hernia over here. It's only a tiny one, but that's that was triggered off by that. Well, you can imagine being a drummer and getting having a muscle pop out. Uh, oh, my you, goodness. I don't, know. Through, I don't know how you finished that show. <laughs> well, I just sort of tucked it back in. It was, it was so strange. And it's as if it never happened. Because I just went back to the kit and started playing. 